Welcome back to the Uncanny Valley podcast. I'm Dakota and I'm here with my wife, Brittany, and we're doing a mini series on these short stories that can't be made into full episodes. And so we're just trying to cover these weird out of place stories and things that we found interesting. Today, we're going to cover two of these short stories, but last week we covered another couple of them. So you'll want to go back to last week's episode and listen to that to get the kind of full feel of what we're doing. The first story we're going to talk about today is the case of the strange green children of Woolpit. This story dates back to the 12th century between 1135 and 1154 in the village of Woolpit located in Suffolk, England. According to the accounts during the Middle Ages, a young brother and sister with all over green hued skin and unusual hued fabric from an unknown origin mysteriously emerged from the village's wolf pits, which were deep ditches designed to trap wolves in that era. The young girl and boy spoke an unrecognizable foreign language and the only food they would eat were beans. They were taken in by village peasants and at first were not given any food as the villagers could not understand their appearance and were kind of scared of them. The two were on the verge of starvation when the people started to give them food, to which the two refused to eat. Then a man came from the fields carrying broad beans and gave them to the children. They didn't know how to open them but wanted to eat them, so they began to cry. The villagers opened the pods and the children began to frantically eat them. For several months, broad beans were all the children would eat, until they decided to try some bread. In time, the two lost their green color and began to learn English. But the brother grew very ill and eventually passed away, but the girl slowly gained strength, began eating a wider variety of foods, and eventually learned enough English to explain that her and her brother came from a place called St. Martin's Land. So before we get further into this story, something we mentioned last week is going Go into these stories with an open mind. They might be folklore to some, but there could be some truths and interesting things found in these stories. And I don't think that science is the only way we can prove if things are real or fake. I think sometimes there just is no genuine explanation for things that have happened in the past. And like in last week's story, this one has another correlation to another missing land that they are very vehemently saying that they're from, St. Martin's Land. And last week's it was the man from Torrid who was from the country, Torrid. That does doesn't exist to that us. doesn't exist and these stories were written by the local i believe it was a priest who actually was the first person to write this story down and so a lot of these accounts the priests were the only people who were keeping records of things in towns so you can take it with a grain of salt if you don't believe in what they say or if you think they're skewing it towards a religious way but in the case of this story i don't know why he would lie about this and i don't know what their point would be of skewing this towards any religion but the reason why priests were the only ones that wrote anything down was because they were the only ones who were taught by the priesthood of how to do Mm -hmm. it so whatever church that they belonged to in this area it was middle ages england yeah it was very early 12th century and so they were going to be from some sort of christian priesthood in other places the priests may have been islamic and they would be the only ones that would be able to write So it just depends on the area that you're from and who was the higher class in that area. And something interesting to compare this to is last week I was talking about the Flying House of Loretto, which also took place in the 12th century. So apparently a lot of things were really weird in the 12th century. An interesting thing, too, is that these kids would only eat the beans. And that was the only food that they felt comfortable with eating. And so they were starving And that could be why the brother died, because he just had too much. Malnourishment. Yeah. St. Martin's Land is where the girl explained that her and her brother had come from. And in this land, it was in perpetual twilight. So it was never bright enough sunlight. Think if you've ever lived somewhere or been somewhere where it doesn't get dark for a month or it gets dark for a straight month. It's in that kind of weird in-between state. She claimed that all the people who lived there with her had green skin. She claimed that they were Christian and had Christian churches, but had little to no light, hence the perpetual twilight look. So it's interesting that she knew about Christianity and... Claimed to be Christian. 
Yeah. And I remember reading that she explained that their churches had bells on them, just like English churches would have had. And she claimed that there was a land by St. Martin's Land that was brighter, but that St. Martin's Land was separated by a great river. And then she explained that the reason why her and her brother only would eat the broad beans was because where they had come from, everything was green. So it was the only food that they knew would be safe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How her and her brother got there was she recounted hearing a strange sound with her brother in their homeland near their village that opened up to reveal a bright hole. They walked through it and it led them to the wolf pits where villagers were working in the fields around them. Basically, this girl walked through a portal and ended up in England from St. Martin's Land. But they heard a strange sound, which is really reminiscent to some of the stories from the book Disembodied Voices, True Accounts of Hidden Beings by Tim Markinensko. I'm going to but I'm butchered his last name. But it was a really interesting book. Basically, this book has stories of people hearing disembodied voices or sounds, and usually they're from the forest. And some of these voices and things sound very artificial. And so I wish back then that she would have had the vernacular to describe the kind of things that she heard because since she just says strange noise like she wouldn't have the words to describe a digital metal sound they just didn't have that well and she could have but whenever they recounted these stories they didn't necessarily write down every detail it would be a little paragraph in a book and it was after some time after she would have forgotten parts of the story but in this book it describes certain experiences like very artificial beeping and almost sounds like the voices are being played from an old cassette luring somebody. So it sounds like they were lured into the forest, stepped through this portal. It also reminds me a lot of Missing 411 stories where kids get lost in the woods. You're one place one second and then you're gone the next. And then sometimes you're found later on with very strange circumstances, very strange marks on your body, maybe in some cases the people were found with marks and scrapes going up like they were sucked out of the forest and then found days later in a previously searched area and a lot of people think that saint martin's land could be a fairy land like actual fairies in a fey world from another dimension And then the girl apparently went on to live a typical life in the village and adopted the name Agnes and later was married. The bones of her deceased green brother were claimed to have been given a Christian burial in the village. Obviously, I don't think if even if they excavated this area, they would be able to decipher his unless his bones were green from the other people. And they could have been bleached by now. Yeah, it's been almost it's been over or almost like a thousand years. Mm -hmm. So later scholarly debate emerged as to whether the entire legend was an imaginative folktale or the account of the green-skinned children was in fact true. Basically, there's two accounts by William of Newburgh and Ralph of Cogshell that document the kids mysteriously appearing. The girl also made specific mention of the area called St. Martin's Land having numerous churches. And while some skeptics dismiss this whole story as a myth, aspects of their story still have never been explained rationally. So how did she come from a different realm that had Christian churches? Or was it the same realm that we live in, just a different place? Yeah, and I had read something that there was a famous poem by an anonymous writer of a story of a land next to a river that they think the medieval people might have gotten inspiration from, but that story doesn't talk about green kids. It's more of a love story, but it could be referencing the same... St. Martin's land. Yeah, there is actually a St. Martin in the Catholic religion. So St. Martin can refer to two different saints who lived in different centuries and regions. So there's one of Martin of Tours, who is a Roman soldier who became a bishop in France. And the other is Martin I, a pope who was exiled and martyred for defending the Orthodox doctrine. And he's recognized as a saint and a martyr in the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches. So the Martin of Tours was born in either the year 316 AD or 336 AD. So it would have been before this Mm -hmm. green children's story. And then the second Martin was around in 649 AD to 653 AD. That's really interesting. What do you think of the green children? Do you think this is true? 
Do you think this is just a folklore? Does it remind you of any other stories of children mysteriously appearing and having been from an unknown land? Things like the black-eyed children, these other stories of children randomly appearing under mysterious circumstances. It's really weird. The strangest thing to me is that they were totally human and that living there long enough made their skin turn back to a normal hue. I also wonder how the children were reacting to things like the sun. Were they Mm -hmm. being blinded? Was their skin being burned more easily from the sun? Were they really hot or Mm -hmm. cold? Makes you really think. And I don't think there's been any scientific explanation as to why their skin would have been green prior to eating the beans. Now, if they were only eating the beans and their skin turned green, that would be a different story. Just like when people turn kind of orangish from eating carrots. But yeah, there's no real explanation as to why they were green. Some people chalk it up to the people just saying they were that color, but I don't, what would be the reason to lie about something like that? Yeah, other than maybe I could see the aspect of saying that they were Christian, that saying, you know, Christianity has spread all over or something. But still, I think that that sort of explanation for the story just doesn't hold water. And I think it's really a very strange account. And I don't like dismissing things just because they're from a certain religion a certain religion or a certain time period. Period because mm-hmm. we have strange things that happen today that a lot of people don't believe, but more people are keen to believe because it's happening in our own time period. I don't think everything you read is necessarily false from mm-hmm. back then. Yeah. Another strange and peculiar tale. Another strange and peculiar tale. My green hued people. Another strange case of somebody mysteriously appearing out of place and out of time was in June of 1950 in New York City. A man dressed in dated 19th century clothes was spotted on a busy sidewalk on 34th Street appearing confused. Witnesses noticed his antique clothing of a jacket, bow tie, handlebar mustache that looked immaculately preserved, apparently. And he attempted to cross the street and he was struck by a car and killed immediately. So already a very strange kind of... He looked like somebody from the 1800s, but it was 1950. Yeah, a really strange person that wasn't dressed for the time period. Apparently didn't know to look across both ways and was struck by a car and killed. He'd probably never seen a car. Yeah. Or at least the cars back then would have been extremely rare. Yeah, cars back then would have been for the very rich and not very seen. And they wouldn't be going very fast anyways. Maybe 20 miles an hour tops. Um, You'd really have to watch out for horse and buggy, which would be a lot louder. Which would trample you. So police arrived to investigate the unusual fatality. Searching his possessions for identification, they were stunned to discover strapped currency dated in 1876 and business cards for a Rudolph Fence Jr. on Fifth Avenue. What's interesting is that the bank notes in the wallet were also from the defunct Bank of New York. It means it's not in place anymore, but does that mean a state bank? Because that would have been even weirder. States didn't state stopped issuing currency before that. But that would be even in- more interesting, though. Was it the Bank of New York, 1876? Does that mean that the state of New York was issuing the currency? Because that would have been even more weird that he even had that currency in 1950. So the Bank of New York was founded by Alexander Hamilton in 1784 and helped Hamilton stabilize the financial situation in America after the Revolutionary War. So this is a really ancient bank in like the terms of the United States that was founded by literally like the bank man himself, Alexander Hamilton. Yeah, and it was, and it's really even dates the money and how strange that you would even have it in 1950. And well, what's more, the currency was still strapped, meaning it was still fresh bills. So his money was issued about 10 years before the bank's closure. So in his timeline, it would make sense to have that currency, but in 1950 to have fresh bills still strapped meaning they still have the paper strap around it from that in 1950 is even more weird and and just rare well and i wonder if we have his bills preserved anywhere i don't know we'll get into the source of this later on the discovery was very strange and obviously they identified him as residing in, in 1876 new york yet he appeared in times square with no modern identification or updated currency. So it was further researched by Captain Hubert V. Rehm 
with the missing persons department, which revealed no records of Rudolph Fence Jr. ever being reported missing. Genealogy records also verified that he had lived from 1847 to 1876 as the son of Rudolph Fence Sr., who was working as a professor in New York City. Yet, how the man somehow teleported almost a century later into 1950s New York City just left everybody super confused. And it's strange that the genealogy records still placed him as living from 1847 to 1876, obviously, until he teleported. Yeah, he they could find a, like his dad and where his dad was. Yeah, were. so he, he existed. So this story was used in a story called I'm Scared from a 1951 science fiction short story by Jack Finney. But it's kind of one of those weird things where some people think it's true, some people think it's not. And Jack Finney didn't make it up. He just used it as inspiration for his own story. Yeah, it's one of those things where the source of it is very vague and maybe that's because it was a fiction story either way these are a collection of fun stories that are more to be used as a thought experiment and just trying to open up your mind and just think how strange would it be if this actually happened so here is a more detailed list of what they found on his person so they found a copper token for a beer worth five cents bearing the name of a saloon which was unknown even to the older residents of new york from that area a bill for the care of a horse and washing of a carriage drawn by a livery stable on Lexington Avenue that was not listed in any address book, about $70 in old banknotes, which back then would have been a lot of money, Mm -hmm. business cards with Rudolph Fence and the address on Fifth Avenue, a letter sent to this address in June 1876 from Philadelphia, and a medal for coming in third place in a three-legged race. So this guy was the epitome of the 1800s, 1870s, and then just appeared. And if you believe in time travel and inner dimensions, something that makes you think is, were these other places unable to be found? Because when he died, it changed the course of history. And I'm really curious, like, what... What did the people in 1876 think when he just... And what did they see? Maybe missing? did they see a portal like in the Green Children open up and he just got swallowed up? So nobody reported him missing back then. Mm-mm. But in their timeline, was he never missing? Yeah, that's strange. He also didn't have any fingerprints anywhere. So it could have been a man from... They don't think it was a man from 1950 posing as somebody from 1876. And... Reem, who continued the investigation, did find a Rudolph Fence Jr. in a telephone book from 1939, and Reem spoke to the residents of an apartment building at the listed address who remembered Fence and described him as a man of about 60 years old who worked nearby, and after his retirement, he moved to an unknown location in 1940. Contacting the bank, Reem was told that Fence died five years before, but his widow was still alive in Florida. Reem contacted her and learned that her husband's father, Rudolph Fence, had disappeared in 1876, age 29. Yeah, that's really strange. And he had left the house for an evening walk and never returned. All efforts to locate him were in vain and there was no trace of where he had gone. Captain Reem checked the missing person files on Rudolph Fence in 1876 and the description of his appearance, age, and clothing corresponded precisely to the appearance of the unidentified man from Times Square. And this case is still marked as unsolved. So it really did happen, and something really happened that from that time period, and then something really happened in 1950. And if you're familiar with the work of Missing 411, it makes you think in maybe 20, 50 years, if some of these people who have been identified from the missing 411 investigations if some like they could just appear one day Mm -hmm. but it's 50 years in the future yeah it just hasn't happened yet it's really scary (laughs) what do you guys think of this story have you ever heard of rudolph fence do you think it's real do you believe in time travel or interdimensional space travel portals parallel universes yeah do you believe in that kind of stuff or is that too far for you Leave us a comment down below. And remember, if you want to be a part of this show, share a story or have an interview done by us, you can leave us a comment down below or you can private message us on Facebook and Instagram and we might consider having you on the show. Don't forget to rate our podcast if you're listening to us on Spotify, Google Podcasts or Apple Podcasts. And don't forget to subscribe if you're on YouTube. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you guys next week.